Well, hello, hello, hello. Hi. Hi, Jonathan. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Nadine? I am good, Jonathan. It's good to be here with you. Yes, and I, it's amazing to be here with you and with everyone else that is uh, tuning in, tuning in uh, today. Um, we have a great show prepared, so we're, we're pretty excited about that. We are. We have an exciting <laughs> guest. Yes, we do. Um, before we continue, we, uh, as always, uh, we want to do our usual acknowledgements and recognitions, and that is that Black Lives Matter. And uh, with that, um, with that said, I just wanted to say that uh, I don't think that the the, the human dignity and the human lives uh, should be uh, taken away or based on what we have in our pockets or what people believe that we. Um, that a person might have been doing. Uh, murder is never okay, uh, no matter where does it comes from uh, and no matter um, who perpetrated, uh, it, it's never okay. Um, and when we are, you know, basing our, our investigations or other, um, or other legal stuff, um, we should have that in consideration and actually seeing the evidence that is presented uh, as objective as we can. Um, say murder is murder. Exactly, um, no matter what. But with that being said, who's this amazing person that is with me today? Hey, my name is Nadine and I am the liaison um, for community engagement with Burke's Teens Matter, my pronouns are they and their. Um, in my work with Burke's Teens Matter, one of the things that I love to do is get out in the community and talk to people about Burke's Teens Matter and about the importance of starting the conversations with young people at a young age. Um, so that's kind of my thing. And I am with the amazing, no, this way. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Jonathan Rodriguez. I use he and him pronouns. L is if, if it's in Spanish, and I'm the Youth and Health Resource Center coordinator for Berkstein's Matters. And my work is basically um, bringing that conversation that Nadine uh, just mentioned uh, to the young people that might need resources or education about uh, any topic that uh, is related to sexual health. Um, but I am not the only one who can have those conversations. We have uh, other people in the community that could um, that could have those conversations with the teens or other adults. And um, with that being said, last week we uh, started our conversation and, and the campaign of Get Yourself Tested Month, yes. which is <laughs> which is April. Yes, get yes. yourself tested. And uh, we, we, we mentioned like um, why it's important to get tested, um, you know, uh, how to bring that conversation with, with a young person in our lives. Um, but tonight, we just, we don't want us to only tell you uh, why it's important to get tested. We kind of wanted to bring someone else, someone with more expertise to talk to us about it. And I say expertise because this person has been in the field for 16 years. So there's a lot of knowledge and experience in uh, their plate. Um, so tonight with us, we have our amazing fl phlebotomist. 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 <laughs> Marlene Cabrera. Hi, Marlene. Hello. Yes, yes, yes. Hi, Nadine. Hi, Jonathan. Hey, Thank Marlene. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're so excited <laughs> to have you here. I'm excited to join you guys. <laughs> Marlene, please, can we, before we continue. Yes. What is a phlebotomist? <laughs> A phlebotomist is a healthcare worker who's trained in drawing blood that's used for testing. Okay. Okay. And Marlene is well trained in that. Marlene is also so much more than just well trained in that. She's a huge asset. Thank you, Nadine. 
<laughs> or, or how how you like to say uh, whatever it takes. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Right. When they ask me, what do I do? Whatever it takes. And Marlene has what it takes. For sure. So Marlene, uh, like I mentioned, you've been in this field for 16 years. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get to do this kind of work or being in this field? Um, a long time ago, I was a student at a technical school and um, I the program I was studying was cardiovascular tech. So that was more heart-related issues, EKGs, and stress testing. But one of the modules that we studied was phlebotomy. So at the end of my course, I had to do an internship, and I came here. And after the internship hours were over, they offered me a position, and I've been here ever since. And she brought all of her heart to what she does, too, let me just say. <laughs> Thank like, you, Daisy. Like she does every single day. And, yep. and, and Important to, to mention that when 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 Marlene says here is because Marlene is also Kelly Wonder Services or Backbone well Berksins Matters Backbone Organization, and uh, she's gonna be the person that if if another person <laughs> comes to get tested, she's gonna be pretty much the first one uh, to talk to them about their sexual health. Mm -hmm. So um, Marlene. Uh, what if you think uh, back to when you started this work, mm -hmm. uh, what surprised you? Um, when I first started here, I was really surprised of how many infections were in our community and how many people are affected by um, STDs and HIV in our community. I was in my 20s and I was, I don't think I was prepared uh, to uh, of what I was going to be exposed or faced with here. Um, and uh, it was just like a, a rude awakening uh, mm -hmm. to see it firsthand, you know. Yeah, because like so many people, you walk around and you're interacting with people all day long and there's nothing about them that would lead you to believe that there might be STIs or STDs or HIV being spread among the community because you can be infected with something and you look just like everybody else. We all look just like, you know, I mean, you look like yourself, but. You right, right. Like you can't else. tell by looking yeah. at someone. And um, I, this is my uh, neighborhood as well as my community. So I think it's really important um, for us to do the work that we do here. Um, I think, especially being one of the free clinics in the community, um, I think it's really, really important to have access to this kind of services. Thanks for that, Marlene. And I always like when you're like, we're just reminding us that the services are free. And for some reason that mean reminded me that we don't often say it, especially on the show, we don't say it a lot, but. All of our services are free and they're free for anybody and people right. don't have to have insurance. And if they have insurance, they don't have to show their insurance and people don't have to have any other kind of papers about anything. It doesn't matter who you are, whether what your status is with the government in any way, shape or form, you can get services here for free. No questions asked. That's correct. It's about anything other than maybe what your risks have been and things like that. Right, right. We don't ask for any identification, any insurance cards. Um, we don't ask uh, your status as far as like being uh, uh, undocumented. Um, so none of that stuff matters here. Yeah. What matters is basically your your sexual health or your health as a whole. Right. 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 Um, talking about. Uh, questions that we may ask. Um, can you describe the process here at Co County, um, you know, the process to get tested? For example, a person wants to get tested, they probably should call uh, and make an appointment. Well, this is Monday, uh, yeah, Monday, because on Mondays we have walkings. Um, so be sure to get here early. Uh, we open at nine. Um, but a person arrives, they are uh, received by our receptionist. Um, uh, uh, they might take, you know, their name and etc. But it comes to the point that 
they need to go in and Marlene calls them. So what's the process after that? Um, so I bring the clients into the clinic um, and I introduce myself. Um, if it's their first visit with us, I usually try to ask what brings them into the clinic, any concerns or symptoms that they may be experiencing. Um, and I also like to, to um, go over the process with them before we even get any paperwork started. So um, I usually start with saying um, who I am. I'm Marlene. I'm going to do your paperwork. I'm going to do your intake and I'll get some blood from you. And then the nurse is going to see you to do the exam part of the visit. So um, for women and men, um, it's different the testing procedure. So for women, um, we after we get your information, um, I would get one tube of blood specimen from the client and that would test for syphilis and HIV. We send that to our laboratory. And Gail, the nurse, does a vaginal exam on women um, and she swabs them for a chlamydia and gonorrhea test, which is also sent to the laboratory. Um, the results come back in a week and um, they're given a phone call a week later with their results. Um, for men, it's a little bit different. Um, the process is a little bit easier for them um, just because the way their anatomy is. Um, so uh, the paperwork is the same. The questions are the same. Um, the blood is collected from men and we ask them for a urine sample to test them for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And their exam is not as invasive as a woman's exam. Um, so their exam is about five seconds. And, uh, and then we send um, their specimens to the lab. Um, one of the main things um, that I do with my clients is a risk reduction plan during the intake process. And I really feel like that's like the meat of our testing process because it identifies what the client's risks are. And in that plan, um, there's also a part of what your plan is now to stay safe. So we can go over what their choices are and what their options are in um, having a healthy uh, sexual health. And in, in you, you mentioned that people don't have to come back necessarily for results. They can just receive a call. Right. Um, so I usually send the specimens out on a Thursday and we overnight them to our laboratory and I get the results back on a Monday morning. So I usually start making calls for results around lunchtime on Mondays. Ooh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. See, I didn't even know that because I was still back in the days when people had to come back in to get their result and not get a phone call. And talking about back in the day, and just to be clear, the men's anatomy is a little different than the female's anatomy. Right. And there's no internal exam of any form for the males. Like there's no swab in the urethra or anything like that that used to really freak men out about the idea of coming for an STD screening. That's like history. Right, right. We never did that here <laughs> as far as I've been here. Um, their, uh, and their exam actually is about five seconds of just looking. Um, so it, it's not painful at all. The nurse is just looking to see if um, their glands are swollen, um, to see if there's any lesions or bumps on their skin that they should be concerned about, and if they have any discharge. Mm, right. But 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 the uh, if a person has a concern, they, they should also come because not necessarily the presence of discharge or, or, or anything else is an indicative that a person has an, SD, an STI, right? Because some STIs just don't present any symptoms. Correct, correct. Especially with chlamydia, I see that often. Um, um, some of our clients come in for routine testing, don't have any concerns. They're just here because they get tested every so often or they come on a yearly basis. And um, 
end up testing positive for an infection like chlamydia and had no symptoms. So they had no idea that they were, you know, infected with chlamydia. So that's one of the main ones that I see here. Marlene, I like that you mentioned that. So you said some people come for routine or like on a yearly basis. Why would people be coming like routinely or on a yearly basis? Because if I got checked and I'm good, aren't I good? Um, for bacterial infections, I would say yes. Um, some of the other infections that we test for, such as syphilis and HIV, can take longer than a week for it to show up. So um, pertaining to syphilis and HIV, those infections have what we call a three-month window period. So that is the time um, from infection that it takes for it to show up in a blood test and that can take up to three months. So we try to encourage people if they had a risk recently to follow up and get those tests done again so they can have a definite answer and then move on. And let me take you back a second to that. And I'm gonna let Jonathan talk in a minute, but I have to ask this question because you know, you know me long enough and well enough that I think too that that risk reduction plan is like the heart of you know, the real meat of what we're doing and, and, and a big piece of why we're here. Um, so when you do that risk reduction plan with people, are you telling them what kind of things they need to do to put down there for action plans or are, are they coming up with those things that they're going to do? Most of the time they come up with their own answers. Um, I do make suggestions sometimes. So if, uh, a goal is something like increased condom use. I would probe them and say, well, how would you do that? What are your plans to make that happen? And if they can't um, come up with anything or can't think of anything, I would suggest like um, keep a bag of condoms in your dresser drawer or keep a bag of condoms at your boyfriend's house, you know, things like that. But I usually try to get them to start developing their own answers because this is their own plan. I can't make their plan for them. You're not going to be there when the moment happens. So. Right. Yeah. I'm not going to be there so make sure you wear your cousins. <laughs> it is very important to, to also guide, not, not necessarily guide them, but just prompt them into thinking what works for them, right? Because we can all, we can tell people what to do, but really that's from our own perspective. And that goes to pretty much everyone else in the community uh, right. and in family dynamics, because, you know, we might think that this worked for me, or I think that this works and this is what you have to do. But the reality is that everyone has their own experiences. Everyone has their own way of thinking. So maybe, Maybe the regular condoms are not their thing, but they're really like the ones that glow in the dark. So <laughs> that's what it takes. Then let's let's go with that round. <laughs> I agree. Everything is not for everyone, and everyone's risk reduction plan is different from the yeah. next person's because everyone's risks are different, everyone's concerns and um, their goals are different as far as wanting to stay safe. So. Wow really like that the goals yeah. are different yeah. <laughs> and uh you know because we're talking about about uh getting tested and 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 maybe you know having the possibility of of, of being affected with with an sti um getting tested could be a, a nervous experience for some people mm -hmm. what do you say to calm a person that might be nervous about the process and and for example, you you were um, I'm making two two uh, questions in one. <laughs> um, and, and if if you know when you're explaining, like for example, the window period or or medical terms, do you break them down to make it more accessible to everyone? Absolutely. Um, everybody's different, so. Um, some people explain uh, what their risks are in a different way than other people. So I just try to meet people where they are. Um, 
when it comes to explaining it to them. Um, if somebody is really nervous when they come in, I usually try to question like what they're nervous about the most and then address that. Um, I definitely, if it's their first time here, I'd like to go over the process of getting tested. So it's not like I'm just doing paperwork with you and then some other lady's gonna come in and she's gonna tell you to take your clothes off and examine you. I'll try to explain everything before she comes in the room. And Gail is really awesome of explaining the exam process during the whole process. So she's really, really good with that. Um, so I just try to, and I, I really try to stress that there's no judgment here. Um, so whatever the issues are that brought them in here, whatever their concerns are, you know, everything here is confidential. There's no one here that's gonna judge them or shame them for something that they've done or they're going through. So that's a big part of it. In, in normalizing the situation too, mm -hmm. because since they meet you and, and until they meet, um, for example, Gail or, or re registered nurse, there's virtually nothing <laughs> that you have heard or that Gail has seen that right. any any in any way shocking. <laughs> right, not anymore. <laughs> not anymore. Um, you know, both both of you have had enough experience dealing with with this topic for for any kind of judgment to to be present because it's just like, well, it's another word. Let's talk about it. You know. It doesn't matter. Uh, it, it doesn't matter really how a person feels about their body. Your body is not the first one that they will be seeing. Right. <laughs> right. Not gonna be the last one in the day that they. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's very important to to say. <laughs> I, I usually like to. Um, not that the human body can be compared to like an automobile, but. <laughs> If you do have an automobile, um, you do service checks on your automobile, like tune-ups and things like that. You get your oil checked and things like that because you're using that big machine. So I just compare it to that and say, like, if you're using these body parts, um, getting tested is part of good sexual health. You want to make sure that these body parts are healthy and working correctly. So I think it's just a big part of sexual health, of getting tested. It's part of it. Yeah. yeah. I like that. I never heard that before, but that's really pretty good. And you know, that yeah. does really, I mean, that helps to normalize it because we're, we're human beings and we have to take care of our bodies. Right. Um, cause that's where we live. Um, so yeah. And just making it quite that simple. And I, and I do really, I mean, if, if you haven't gotten the vibe yet out there, folks, I mean, truly Marlene is not judgmental about any of this kind of stuff, but neither is, um, Gail, it's like, you know, you're here, we're here for a purpose to serve and we know that people are human and people make choices and even good choices could end them up here um, feeling a need to be tested. It's not necessarily that you've done something that you need to feel bad about or feel ashamed of. It's just that you've been out there being human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in, absolutely. In, in talking about being human, um, we, we have a young humans that sometimes uh, come to our clinic. Um, have you seen many teens uh, here at, uh, for SDI testing at Co County? Yes, I have. Um, I really like when the teens come in because it's just kind of like a new, uh, fresh mind um, to kind of educate, you know, um, some people come in and they are very nervous um, and they don't necessarily know the questions to ask or how to explain um, what they're feeling, maybe sometimes as symptoms. So um, a big part of what we do here is education, um, not just on anatomy and the way their body works, you know, and, uh, and that's their sexual organs on the inside and the outside of their bodies, um, but on how to make choices that keep them safe and what their options are as far as the choices they have and staying safe. So I, I really enjoy when a younger person comes in um, and I, I do my best to try to make them as comfortable as possible throughout the whole process. 
And what age is like, do I have to be like 18 or 16 or something like that to come here to be tested? Nope. Um, we take um, teenagers. I believe you don't need a parental um, guardian um, unless you're under the age of 12 to be seen here. So I have seen 13 year olds um, without parents and guardians. Um, I have seen people in their 80s. <laughs> so without the parents age, or guardians? Without parents or guardians. <laughs> What's the world coming to? <laughs> so, um, you know, I've seen a, a variety of, of different ages come through the clinic. And, and that's good to know because I, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Jonathan. No, no, no. Go, go ahead, Nadine. I was just going to say because I think a lot of times, um, at least what I've encountered in the community and when I think back to when I was younger, like somebody 13, 14, um, really might be hesitant to, to say anything to their parents. And if 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 they're afraid for whatever reason or concerned about that, don't want, aren't ready to talk to their parents about something, it's good to know that they can come here and they can get the care that they need and they can also get some information and education um, rather than just holding it in and not taking care of what they need to take care of. Right, right. And it's very important because you know year after year, uh, after a year, <laughs> the statistics show us that about 50% of the new STI infections in the U.S. happen amongst uh, those uh, ages of 15 to uh, 24 uh, years old, even though mm -hmm. only make up about 25% of the population. Um, so uh, in, in your experience uh, mm -hmm. uh, with teens, um, do they have or have you encountered that they have a good understanding of sexual of, of their sexuality and their choices uh, that they're making about their sexual behavior? Um, be, because, you know, right now we, you know, we have the Internet. There's a ton of information. Do you think this translates into teens who come uh, for services, you know, being well informed about their sexual health? Um. I do agree. There is a lot of information on the internet. Um, there's also a lot of wrong information on the internet. Um, so you really have to watch like what sites it has to be like a reputable site. Um, if you're going to get like medical facts and things like that about infections or um, risks. Um, I feel like a lot of our teens uh, don't understand um, the impact or how the choices they can make now regarding their sexual health can affect their future. Um, so just um, bringing that to their attention and making them aware of some of the choices that they make today could possibly affect their future goals, um, their future health, um, whether it's we're talking about uh, preventing pregnancy or STIs or their self-esteem, you know, all of these things regarding their sexual health can be impacted, you know, their future can be impact, impacted by those things. So it's really important for them um, to get an understanding and um, to know that this is normal. If they are sexually active, this is all part of being a responsible person. If you're sexually active, this part comes with it, getting tested to make sure that you're safe and and you're going to stay healthy. And, and to piggyback a little bit to what you said, uh, there is a lot of information, um, but not all the information, just like Marlene said, is is you know, it's comprehensive, it's posi positive, and not all of it is true. Um, I, you know, me at the HRC, I see this constantly. <laughs> so um, it's great for, you know, a team may come and they may say, oh, I thought that this was this or this was that, or maybe even the terminology that they're using might not be as clear. Um, so it's good that they come to a professional that is in the field that can actually respond to to or clar clarify um, uh, the, the information that may that they may have heard um, because even even sometimes in in the in, in families we don't necessarily have the the most 
current or factual information. So it's always good to clarify. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes I get, um, I forget, it was a few years back, there was this picture surfacing on the internet about a new STI. And um, yeah. it I, was, yeah. Uh -huh. that? Um, I think that had a lot of like circles or something like that. I think it was like purple body yeah. part or something. Yeah, what yeah. was that? I remember that. I can't like remember. Something waffle. Yes. Oh. Blue waffle. Blue waffle. There you go. Blue waffle. <laughs> Purple waffle. <laughs> so so every once in a while something like that pops up. Um and uh you know we have to uh <laughs> we have to cut those clips away. Yeah, we have we have to clarify. So um I'm not sure where that came from. Um it does look like uh that body part was a little unhealthy, you know, but I don't believe it had anything to do with STDs. I think mm -hmm. they had some other health conditions going on. And, and I, yeah. that's important information to have. <laughs> yes. Yes. Important. And I like the way that you said it um, a little while back. So simply in terms of if you're sexually active, then this is part of being responsible, um, you know, in your life for your sexual health. Right. It's just like, it's so simple, like years and years, I think, of layers of shame and stigma and everything else um, associated with sexual health and associated with STIs. But it's just very simple. If you're sexually active, then the responsible thing is to take care of your health by, you know, it's like you take your car to get an oil change and things That's like right. that. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And, and um, taking, taking care of you and it, it's taking care of others. Right, right. Taking care of the the person that you you have sexual intimacy with, it's being responsible for them as well, you know. And um, but there was one part of the um, testing process that I left out um, that I wanted to mention. Um, when the women are done getting their exams done, um, the nurse takes another swab, a vaginal swab. And she looks under the microscope with the client and she even shows them their cells under the microscope, which I think is really cool. That's just like the science lover in me. Um, but they get to look at their own cells under their own vaginal cells under the microscope. And what the nurse is looking for, um, she's looking for other forms of infections, not necessarily STD. She's looking for a yeast infection in women. Um, she's looking for bacterial vaginosis in women, which is not an STD. It's, like an off balance of the woman's pH balance. Um, and she also looks for trichomonas, which is an STD. Um, so those three answers, the the woman can have the day of their exam. Their STD results come back from the lab a week later, but at least they have some kind of, um, you know, like information about their health um, before they leave here, before they even get their results back. So I, I think that's a big piece. Um, sometimes I go to my own doctor and um, it's hard to even get eye contact from a provider sometimes. Uh -huh. So to have a provider show you your own cells under a microscope and spend that time educating you about your body, I think that's awesome. I think that's an awesome piece of what we do here. It's like hands-on education. I love it. Right, right. <laughs> that is really nice. And how long does this, like all this stuff that you're doing, the intake and the plan and drawing the blood and having the exam and maybe looking under the microscope and all, how long does that take? It takes, um, for about a male, for a male visit, it takes about 45 minutes. Um, and for a woman, it takes about an hour. Is there a, like a lot of waiting time before people get seen? Uh, if you come in on a, on a Monday, if you come in on a Monday, I can't guarantee the waiting time. Um, it's first come first serve. And we only see the first nine clients on a Monday that show up here. Um, so depending on what the client's risks are or, or symptoms or if they need treatment, that kind of thing, it could take a little bit longer. 
So if you are pressed for time, I do not suggest that you come in on a Monday. I do suggest that you schedule an appointment. You'll be seen at that specific time. And you give treatment too? Yes. Yeah, so if somebody comes in um, because they were exposed to an infection, um, let's say a girl comes in and she says, I'm here because my partner told me that he has chlamydia or he has gonorrhea. We would treat that client that day. And that's called presumptive treatment. We're treating you just in case um, because you had an exposure and this is before your results come back. So if it would be positive the following week when it's time to give you your results, you wouldn't need medication because you already got your treatment. Oh, wow. um, so we treat here. If somebody tests positive for chlamydia, gonorrhea, or syphilis, we do have treatment here for that. Um, we also treat for people who have outbreaks of the herpes simplex virus, um, the genital outbreaks. We can't do any treatments for uh, the type one, like cold sores or fever blisters. Um, and we also do treatment for genital warts here in the clinic. And just to have it out there, is there any charge for these treatments? No, all our services are free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you asked that, Jonathan. <laughs> Which is pretty neat. <laughs> it really is. <laughs> we're almost um we're we're almost running out of time. Um, but just to 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 know um Marlene, um what seems to be in your opinion uh, the biggest concerns about STIs for for uh, for teens or for the teens that you've seen? Um, <clears throat> one of the things um, that I hear often in the clinic that come from teens um, is um, they believe um, oral sex is safe uh, because uh, there's no risk of pregnancy with oral sex. Um, and they also believe that anal sex is safe because there's less risk of pregnancy, you know? Um, but uh, that is not necessarily true. And I try to, you know, urge that to them as much as possible. Um, we've recently, within the last year, started testing the throats for chlamydia and gonorrhea because a lot of people use condoms for vaginal sex or anal sex, but not for oral sex. And they are testing positive for those infections in their throat. I'm really excited that we started doing that because I would hate for somebody to fall between the cracks and, you know, we weren't able to diagnose them correctly correctly if you know we didn't test their throat um so i'm glad that we're doing that now just to show them that it is a risk you know that it's not necessarily safe um and also um anal sex has been on the rise with a lot of teens i i think it has a lot to do with prevention of pregnancy and them thinking it's safer but that's actually the riskiest kind of sex involved there's usually tearing of the skin um, which involves bleeding and being exposed to somebody's blood that, you know, it, it's a risk. So um, just that they, they're they aware of that, I think that's really, really important um, for them to know, um, just because a lot of them are just starting out in their sexual um, lives. <laughs> yeah, so their sexual journey. So um, just so they have the correct information. Um, in order to stay safe. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah, and part of that, you know, uh, part of that uh, uh, information is, you know, uh, there's nothing wrong with anal sex, with vaginal sex, with oral sex. Um, there's nothing wrong with uh, behave, um, sexual behaviors that, um, that are consensual as long as, you know, there are certain precautions that are being taken, for example, you know, using condoms, getting tested, knowing the person, and also being accountable with one another. Mm -hmm. If one has multiple partners, which is considered a risky, uh, a, a high risk behavior, at least having an open communication and, and, and accountability between partners can really make a difference. Uh, at least you can know, you know, is, is, is this something that I'm, 
Uh, is this some uh, a risk that I'm willing to take? And if I'm going to take it, what can I do to be safe? Right. I, I really I really like the way you said that, Jonathan. I think it's really, really important for people to have open um, conversation with the person that they're intimate with about their concerns or maybe um, about getting tested or about um, previous risks that they had. I think it's all part of of good um, sexual health to have an open dialogue with the person that you're intimate with. Um, sometimes um, I would get a client who um, may come off as a little shy and um, doesn't necessarily know how to start that conversation with a partner. So um, I like doing role plays here and pretending like I'm the partner so I can pretend how they're going to react and they can come up with an, you know, a response on their own. Um, but I think that's, you know, if I, I really try to stress to the teens, if you can't have an open conversation, an honest conversation about your sexual health with the person who you're having sex with, um, I think maybe mm -hmm. having sex is not a good idea. You know, it, it's all part of being responsible. Um, you uh, oftentimes my clients here in the clinic that I would say, if you meet somebody new and you like this person, your first date should be here at my job. <laughs> 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 and I'll try to make it as romantic as possible. Um, so, <laughs> not necessarily the first date. I can understand that. But definitely before discontinuing condoms with someone. Um, if you guys do decide to get tested together, it can give you peace of mind um, and it can also establish a little bit of trust early in a relationship. So um, so I always try to stress that, too, um, about being able to talk to uh, a partner or a potential partner uh, about getting tested. That's amazing. And it um, is. Nadine, do you have anything else that you think that we should cover? Oh, I have. I could be here all all night talking. So, because um, this is a pretty amazing conversation. But I'm gonna not ask anything else now. And who knows? Maybe we'll have Marlene back again sometime. I would love to join you guys. Thank you for having me. Um, I think this is awesome what you guys are doing, um, and I think it's really really important for our community. So thanks again for having me, and I would love to be a guest in the future. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> you already said it. I'm going to put a <laughs> note about it. <laughs> you, know, you, can, uh, you can all, uh, if you want to get tested or if you think uh, someone that you know wants to get tested and you're looking for a place that offers uh, free testing, free treatment, uh, free uh, risk reduction plan, and just a good conversation with an amazing person. <laughs> Yes. You can, uh, you can reach out to Co County Wellness Services either on Facebook or make an appointment uh, and talk to uh, Marlene. Or if you're a teen uh, between the ages of 13 to 19, you can actually come and talk to me and I can put you in contact with all the services and offer a variety of information. And just to yeah. clarify, Jonathan, a person doesn't need to be sexually active or have any reason to be tested for SDIs to talk to you? No, okay. no, no, no. Someone that just want information that maybe has questions that they haven't been able to, to ask, or if they just want to have a, an honest and open and positive conversation about sexual health. And remember that sexual health doesn't have to involve the genitals <laughs> or any <laughs> sexual behavior. Sexuality is very... Uh, it's basically part of the human experience. Like, mm -hmm. if you want to have a conversation about that, you can always come to me <laughs> <laughs> and we can talk all about it. Um, anything all else? I can say is that the youth of our community are really lucky to have both of you to talk to. Oh, and you, Nadine, and you to steer the ship. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marlene, for being here for for allowing you uh, allowing us to to share this space with you. Um, hopefully, you will be with us in the future. 
I will. Thank yeah. you guys for having me. Awesome. This was awesome. Great. Thank yeah, you. Well, it's fun, well, thank you. Hello, everyone. Bye. We'll see you Tuesday at 5.30. Bye. Bye.